Cultivate your faith with the pure Word of God. Hello, friends. Peace and grace be multiplied unto you. Welcome to Cultivate Your Faith, a presentation of the pure Word of God. Here we grow by expecting and depending on the sure promises of God to fulfill in a personal way. Here's your host, Dr. Troy Campbell. Christ, our second Adam. Christ, our second Adam. Hello, friends. We will continue our study of the sanctuary. Again, our goal is to understand Christ in a personal way. Our series has three sections. In section one, all are invited to experience Christ's victory achieved at the cross and imputed to individuals for his or her justification. In part one of section one, we learn that God the Father made a covenant with his Son from the foundations of the world to redeem man. Today, we will explore the precious truth of Christ becoming one of us. Let us pray. Father, our desire is to learn of Christ through his words by the Spirit. Amen. Part 2 of Section 1 Christ, our second Adam Christ, our second Adam. Today's study opens our minds to understand further the heart of God. When Adam disobeyed God and ate of the tree of good and evil, the consequence was death. No doubt about that. No living thing, neither plant, animal, angel, archangel, no man is allowed to trifle with the law of God. The law of God is the foundation of his kingdom, and an attempt to break or to change would be an attempt to usurp his power. While we receive his grace, we are not allowed to trifle with his laws. I wanted to make that very clear, my friends. Here is where God's law and his grace meet each other. Here is where justice and peace kiss each other in the heart of God. You you see, while Adam was convicted of death for breaking the laws of God, he was not condemned. The believer will learn that God is in the saving business, not the destroying business, that is, the devil's work. While the law of God convicts and shows us where we are wrong, it doesn't condemn us. Here we understand Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law. John 3, 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So while Adam broke the laws of God, he was not left alone to pay an ultimate consequence, because there was a plan made from the foundation of the world. We talked about this in part one of this series, Revelation 13, verse 8, which tells us that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. You see, God is love, and that is his nature. And when love gets together, it produces When daddy and mommy make love, they produce. Forgive me for my imagination here. But is that clear? I think so. It can't be clearer, really. So when God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit got together in communion, they produced. They made the world. They made man. You see... God had created plants, animals, great landscapes, and the vast multi-universe. But God found great joy and pleasure 
in making intelligent beings who he could reason with. But this came with a risk. This risk was that man would have the freedom to disobey. So considering that God by nature is love, the perfect solution then to their problem was to have a plan for God the Son to give his life to redeem man in case man sin. The options were, one, make man like the plants and animals without the ability to make morally responsible decisions. And number two, make man with intelligence, freedom of choice to love or not to love. This was personal for God. They desired the latter, and the latter came with the plan to redeem man in case he disobeyed. My friend, the risk here is with God, not with man. The perfect plan is laid for man to be redeemed. I believe it is easier to be saved than to be lost because the entire heaven is on the side of the believer. Noted in Romans 8 verses 38 and verse 39, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man was highly intelligent. I imagine that Adam was able to name all the inhabitants of the earth without a course in taxonomy. For a while, Adam spent time with angels and reasoned with God himself. It is clear, however, that while Adam had the vast knowledge, it was knowledge of good. His curiosity, which was taken advantage of by the adversary, was to know evil. Genesis 3 verse 22 to 24 says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned away, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Heaven was designed to perpetuate good, to perpetuate love, and to perpetuate peace. Evil was not allowed. Adam now knew bad. His character was tarnished, and he had to go through a restoration process on the earth. For Adam to have been allowed to stay in the Garden of Eden would be to perpetuate and to perpetrate evil. So Adam had to exit the Garden of Eden as he was now corrupted with the knowledge of evil. But while that was the option man had to face. What was God's option? Remember, God's nature is to love. This was personal for God. From time to time, God would visit with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now what? Does God stay a far way off? Does he stay by himself? No. Thank God, no. God desired to be with man. This is a precious truth. I can't say clearer. I hope the Holy Spirit will communicate this to the ears of my listeners. God desires to be with you, though you have gone astray. So God decided to become one of us, so as to save us. God took it personally. When Adam was asked to leave, God decided to go with him. He decided to become like Adam, to become the second Adam, so as to redeem the first Adam. 
1 Corinthians 15 verse 45 makes this clear. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Let us understand that in Genesis 2 verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That was Adam. Now, how about the second Adam? Follow me, my friends. And when Mary asked the angel, how will she be conceived? Considering she knew no man and she wasn't married. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Thus the second Adam was made of the Spirit of God. Let us go back to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 through 49. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural. Adam was natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, as is the earthy. Such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Such a powerful promise. Friends, I encourage you to read this text several times and meditate on it. We ought to live by the Spirit and look forward to the heavenly. As Adam was the father of the earthy family, so Christ became the father of the heavenly family. He replaces Adam. He became the second Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. The word of God is rich with promises. God loves us so much. He committed his only begotten son for our redemption. My One of my favorite texts comes to mind, right? John 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. My friends, the word of God is clear, and I implore you to take it personally. To receive in your very being, we ought to live by the word of God, which is life. We ought to live by the spirit of God. We ought to put aside the old man, Adam, which is of the flesh, and take on the new Adam, Christ, and live by the spirit. We are told to do this in Romans 13, verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. What is, what is the lust of the flesh? In short, all that is not of the Spirit is of God. All that is outside of the will of God. All that is of this world that is not of God. That is the provision of the flesh. Hebrews 2 verse 14 puts it all together. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Here clearly... Genesis 3 verse 15, the promise from part 1 of this series is fulfilled. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between the seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice the first person, I. It is all the work of Christ, and for us 
to believe. Today, Christ is the head of our human family. Christ has made a way for our redemption. Christ is our redemption. In subsequent parts to this series, we will explore this with Christ, which Christ has achieved through the sacrificial services. This was explained to Adam, and by believing, by receiving the truth of the coming Messiah, he killed the first sacrificial lamb, which represented the Lamb of God, Christ. God was the first to preach the gospel of the coming Messiah, and Adam believed it. Coats from the lamb's skin were made to cover Adam and Eve from the elements of sin. This represented the righteousness of Christ. This promise was accepted by Abel and rejected by Cain. Follow me, where Abel offered a lamb, but Cain offered produce of plants from his garden. Enoch and Noah were true to this promise. Remember Noah making a sacrifice after the, the flood? Abram believed God and it accounted him righteousness. Abram believed in the coming Messiah. His faith in the Messiah was manifested by leaving his ancestral land and later his willingness to offer his son Isaac as an ultimate demonstration of his faith in the promised Lamb of God. Jacob built many altars and offered many sacrifices as he believed in the promise. Israel forgot the essence of the sacrifice in Egypt, but it was illustrated in the Passover as the lamb's blood was placed on their doorpost the night before the firstborn of men were killed in Egypt and the people of God were delivered. God gave Moses then instructions on the same sacrificial system in the wilderness. This sacrificial system is a golden thread that brings the truth of God in our hearts. An understanding, my friends, of the sacrificial services will seal the truth in our hearts. I promise you. My friend, I promise you, if you hang in there with me for the next set of presentations, you will receive the truth. As water is water, and as grass is grass, we will accept the truth of Christ and his righteousness as eternal truth. This truth will seal our hearts and give us eternal life. All in a personal way. The word of God says in Hebrews 10 verse 11, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Who is that? This sacrificial system pointed to Christ the Lamb of God, who gave his life for us. And today, he sits at the right hand of God. Romans 5, verses 10 through 11. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man's sin entered into the world, which man was that? The first Adam. As by one man's sin entered into the world, the death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. My friend, isn't that clear? When John the Baptist saw Christ approaching, he exclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John 1 verse 29. I will finish 
this presentation with Hebrews 2 verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. Wow. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Wow. Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren. Friend, take it personally. Christ is not ashamed to call you his brother or his sister. In part three, we will continue to further cultivate our faith with this precious truth from the Word of God. I leave you, as usual, with the theme text for this series, John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thanks for listening to Cultivate Your Faith. We cultivate our faith by feeding on the Word of God. By sharing we receive, by receiving we grow. Will you share as you have received? Join us next week as we continue our journey. Go to cultivateyourfaith.com to sign up to our email list, subscribe for new episodes, and find the resources mentioned in the show notes. Until next time.